I have come to bring fire to the earth. Please sit down. <clears throat> Decided to end on a light note today. <laughs> the last sermon as your canon for innovative ministry in our lections are ready and rearing, aren't they? I, I still recall that first drive from the airport. I was in a cab. Uber wasn't yet a thing, so I'm dating myself. I stared out the window in amusement at this totally foreign landscape of little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky-tack pink and green and blue and yellow, just like the song said. I still recall cresting Taylor Street for the first time to be greeted by the cathedral in the full thrall of the California Mezzogiorno its gray concrete body reflecting that brilliant white light in this kind of cinematic intensity, so otherworldly, it appeared at first like a temple made of moon rock, a lighthouse to the city in the middle of the day, a beautiful and an improbable paradox. I still recall how utterly alien the world outside the hotel seemed that night when I stepped out to get an energy drink so I could stay up all night writing my sermon, Some Things Truly Never Change. <laughs> the cathedral's blinding facade at night gave way to a muted and stoic defiance as it stood unbending against the furious fog rushing over and down the hill. And wishing I had brought a heavier jacket, like countless other summer tourists, I suddenly understood the meaning of that famous quip the coldest winter I ever spent, et cetera, et cetera. You know how it goes. When I finally stepped foot in the cathedral, it was surprisingly empty. Uh, and each footstep just reverberated. It echoed through the whole space. And I was getting more and more nervous <laughs> with, with each step. And I was sort of feeling at a certain point like helplessly small and inadequate with these thoughts of like, why did I even bother applying? They're just going to say no. And just then, a figure appeared over here in uh, the north aisle and greeted me with this chipper voice. Oh, you must be one of the candidates. Welcome to Grace Cathedral. Come here. It was Charles. And he made some kind of dad joke. I forget what it was. But it was perfect. It just melted my anxiety in that moment and helped me to feel a little bit more at home in this truly majestic space. I've tried always to carry that spirit into every interaction I have with other people coming in here for the first time as well. I got ready to preach, and uh, after the service, after the 6 p.m., uh, Jane took me back to the vestry and said, well, I can't guarantee anything, but you can preach. And after the interviews, Mark Stanger took me to the shrine of St. Jude, just down here at St. Dominic's, to light a candle. It was very sweet. He said, We'll light a candle for you. I can't guarantee anything, but we'll light a candle. <laughs> yeah. The rest, as they say, is history. And what a history it has been. On the way to St. Dom's, Mark drove me down Jones Street for the first time. And any of you who've experienced this in your life, Jones Street is like one of the steepest graded hills anywhere of any street in the United States. And I just remember gripping the dashboard for dear life as the car went down and asking, is it safe? And he said, oh, yes, it's fine. You'll get used to it. I mean, some 10 years on, I'm not sure that I have. But it has been quite the ride, hasn't it? And this seemingly permanent structure became a roller coaster of change and chance that I could never have foreseen when I answered the call to serve you in 2012. By faith, Hebrews tells us, God's people embarked on improbable journeys to strange and distant lands, faced impossible odds, and prevailed time and again against all reason. And by faith, we continue to do the same. By faith, we built up the largest continuous yoga practice, not just in a Christian space or even a cathedral, but in the Northern Hemisphere. Think about that for a moment. By faith, we embraced again the gift and power of the labyrinth in this space, celebrating once more Lauren Artris's legacy and working with partners to extend the labyrinth's capacity to catalyze healing and creativity in our community. By faith, we launched our own sound bath, helping people connect to their inner lives through the rhythms and resonances of music that penetrates deep into the subconscious. 
By faith, we planted the vine, a new contemporary worshiping community in the cathedral space that embodies the justice, creativity, and compassionate connection we aspire to every day in every part of our cathedral life. None of these successes has come without a cost. When I arrived, yoga was merely tolerated, viewed by some with a little bit of suspicion, perhaps even competition for the Sunday congregation. Labyrinth walks were described as a rogue ministry that needed to be reined in, despite having its very genesis in our space. Sound baths were just beginning to pop up in the city's spirituality scene, but we were reluctant. Did we really want to be that church? We already have so much stuff like yoga going on. Before I arrived, several conservative megachurches and denominations had frankly painted a target on San Francisco. They set about to feverishly plant new churches throughout the Bay Area, proving that their brand of outwardly contemporary but inwardly conservative church could flourish even in the most hostile of cultural environments. Their ultimate goal, to reshape our city in their image. But not everyone fits that image, especially LGBTQIA people. In planting the vine, our cathedral made space for many who might not otherwise have a church home. We have come so very far in just 10 years. And none of this could have been possible apart from the bold and visionary leadership of our bishop and our dean. Most leaders in most settings like Grace would never risk their reputation and resources to pursue such unconventional programs and ministries. But we did. One of my favorite memories was visiting these churches with Malcolm when we were thinking about planting the vine. And Malcolm was so great. He wasn't just like, you know, go for it. He actually showed up. He came along for the ride. He advised and cheered us on at every step of that journey. His visible support of our efforts to build something new and exciting at Grace has given us experiences like Beyonce Mass and Pride Mass, things that honestly would have been inconceivable in this space just a few years earlier. His open-hearted embrace of our yoga community extended beyond mere cameos at important post-yoga events. He embedded himself in the community, finding time in the midst of his crazy schedule to practice with us nearly every single week, and still does. I cannot tell you what a difference that has made to the people in that group. And when even I was reluctant to build out our own sound bath, Malcolm insisted that we not miss this opportunity to help people connect in a way that they were already connecting in our city. At every point, the strong team our dean had created around him made these milestones possible. It takes a small village of capable and thoughtful colleagues to bring these offerings to life, and I cannot think of anyone I would rather serve with than these beautiful people. Bishop Mark, likewise, has used his clout to lift up our innovative ministries across the church as models for the diocese and the wider church to emulate. His support has extended beyond mere lip service. Our bishop made it a priority in the last dean search to call someone who would lead us with courage, wonder, and joy, and I think he did. And in these transitional times between deans, our bishop showed me and all the staff a measure of unconditional love and support that really helped us get through that difficult time. I am so grateful to his leadership and to your leadership, Malcolm. Again, I cannot think of two people I would rather have leading our church. What our bishop and our dean both understand is that Jesus isn't just our savior, brother, or Lord. He is also our pioneer, perfecting our faith by leading us into new places that challenge our comfort for the sake of the gospel. Jesus calls us to risk everything in the service of reaching those who might not otherwise know the reality of God's immense love for them. In doing so, we often receive even more than we give. This is the divine economy we call grace. And how much have we received from one another? When our faith meets God's grace, anything is possible. I want you to remember that. Jesus reminds us in the gospel today that faith empowered by grace is not so much a sentiment as a revolution. And revolutions are by their very nature divisive. 
a fire that burns hot for justice, that shines light on the shadows where inequity and harm lurk, that purges privilege to clear space for new growth in our society, that kindles our hearts as it awakens hope within us of a new heaven and a new earth. This fire is the grace that gives our faith power to usher in that new creation here and now. By faith, Nina Pickerel established Bayview Mission at Hunter's Point. By faith, we locked arms with Anthony Turney as we marched to the Castro for marriage equality. By faith, Ellen Clark King led us in fearless resistance against the misogyny we saw under the prior presidential administration. By faith, Alma Robinson and others led us to support ending slavery for good. By faith, Lisa Wong led many of us just last Sunday to march in support of the Chinese American community in the wake of rising violence against them. And by faith, our bishop continues to lead on the urgent crisis of climate change. I am so encouraged that our new vice dean, Greg Kimura, is calling us once more to this vision of grace-filled faith as he leads a pilgrimage to the U.S.-Mexican border. I am equally grateful for the deep and faithful leadership of two priests that I admire beyond words, Mary Carter and Ana Rossi. Mary Carter, who does such a beautiful job every single week, offering her full heart in the service of ministering to our congregation. Anna, whose deep and poetic sensibility nourishes the life of worship and prayer for everyone who enters this place. Each one of us here has a story to tell, a story of God's grace encountering our faith and leading us into deeper love and solidarity with each other and with our world, especially those on the margins. We are, all of us, undergoing a baptism, dying to the old self, the old ways, the old world, even as we are immersed in it. We are all rising from the waters of chaos and rebirth, a new people, a pioneering people, telling a different story about our world. We are all individually and collectively bearing up under the stress of this mystic metamorphosis as wisdom refashions us in her image. I am so grateful to have been a part of your story these past 10 years and for all the care that you've shown me through times of struggle like my mother's death and in times of rejoicing like my ordination. Grace will forever be that place for me where faith is made real in flesh and blood, in bread and wine, in water and fire and oil, and above all, in each and every single one of you. Whatever the changes and chances of this life, please, beloved Grace, keep the faith. Amen.